Welcome to the Living Unconventionally podcast. Every week I feature a new unconventionalist who has ditched their desk in order to chase their passions around the world. Every Monday we talk about their epic travel adventures. Every Wednesday we continue the conversation and figure out just how they're able to make these travels happen from a financial standpoint. Every Friday, I do a solo episode where I talk about my own entrepreneurial journey so that you can learn from my successes and failures. And I also discuss my own travels. If you would like to be a part of a community of like-minded, travel-loving, adventure-seeking people, you can join us in the Living Unconventionally Facebook community by going to livingunconventionally.com forward slash Facebook. I hope this podcast and that community will help you get started on your own freedom journey so that one day I can be featuring you and your world travels. Welcome to episode 171 of the Living Unconventionally podcast. Today, I'm continuing my conversation with Robin Rodig, and if you've already listened to part one, you'll know that after 16 fulfilling years in corporate, Robin felt the need to make a major life change, and that came in the form of moving to Switzerland for several months. Our conversation today actually picks up with Robin talking about the transition back into life in the States after realizing she didn't want to go back to the life she had prior to moving to Switzerland. In this episode, we're also going to be talking about how Robin is able to fund her travels with photography using only her iPad and iPhone, and why she chooses to live out of a suitcase even when she's at home. So let's not waste any more time and go ahead and dive right on in with Robin. Well, Robin, thank you so much for being back on the show, and I'm really excited to dive into the ways that you are able to make this travel lifestyle happen. You've really found a great routine for yourself, and, and I know routine's not necessarily the best word, but you know, you found a, a pattern of travel that really works for you, and you know, in part one, we talked about how you were in a corporate setting, and you actually enjoyed your job, which is not a common thing, but you still felt the need to shake things up. So do you mind talking to us a little bit about what it is that you're doing now to help you live this travel lifestyle? Yeah. When I got back from that trip, I admittedly was not sure what I was going to do. I wasn't sure where my next paycheck was coming from. I just thought I would come back and figure it out and just jump into something else. But an interesting thing happened, you know, during that trip, um, as I had a lot of time to reflect and, and figure out what was next for me. And there really were two things that I kept coming back to about what I wanted life to look like for me. And one of them was, I wanted to make sure that I could continue to travel in longer periods of time. So not necessarily like a week here or maybe two weeks. I really love the idea of being able to go somewhere and immerse myself and and really have like an authentic living experience for as long as I can. So Mm -hmm. when I travel, as I have in the last several years, I typically go for about six to eight weeks. And, And I feel like that's a comfortable amount of time for me. And I don't try to do more than one country at once. Um, I really try to keep using the word immerse, but it's the best way to describe it. You know, have a home base, try and live like a local as much as possible, obviously, and just really absorb. So having said that, okay, so that was the first thing is to be able to have bigger chunks of time to be able to do that. The second thing was I just really wanted to spend as much time as possible with family and friends. So, you know, trying to marry those two things as goals in my life or intentions in my life, you know, I knew that going back to a traditional work environment was probably not going to support that. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's hard enough to get, at least from my past life, as I call it, it's hard enough to get two weeks off at mm-hmm. a time, let alone six to eight weeks. So I knew that I was going to have to get creative. So interestingly, while I was away that first time, you know, it was a good lesson for me because there were a lot of people as I was writing and you know, showing pictures once I got home and whatnot, that, you know, I was really getting some great feedback and, you know, not just from my closest family and friends, but from people I didn't know. And I really took it in and thought to myself, gosh, like 
I might actually be good at this and just paid attention to like a lot of the positive stuff that was coming my way. And so ultimately over the last several years, I have a couple of things. I started doing art shows and have vendor space to show my work, primarily photography from my travels. I also love like authentic textiles from places that I go. So like last fall I was in Argentina and like, I couldn't wait to bring fabric back home with me. And so it's just, it just really spoke to my creative side to work with fabric somehow. So I actually also create, usually the pieces that I do are made with the fabrics that I bring back. And I'll usually create like, um, an iconic image from my trip. Um, let's say, for instance, uh, having been to Bali or Indonesia, I had brought back some really like vibrant fabrics, and you know the Om symbol is very uh, sacred and whatnot mm-hmm. there. So you know to acrylic paint that on and frame it and just kind of make these kind of iconic pieces from places I'd been. Sorry, that was like a roundabout way of telling you <laughs> what I'm doing, but. <laughs> But between those art pieces and my photography, I have been able to earn income from, like I said, uh, art shows, vendor space and whatnot. But in addition to that, my writing has also served me well. I'm a contributor in Huffington Post, and they've picked up many of my articles over the last couple of years and have written for written articles for like a little passports. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that company. It's a great concept to teach children ages like five to 12 about the world in kind of uh, that's age appropriate. So little passports. Um, I've written for a global PR company. So it's been in- interesting to see how this is all, how my passion has sort of, you know, delivered me <laughs> some right. of these opportunities that have just really benefited me and and I've been able to support myself. But in addition to that, again, sometimes you got to get creative. And, you know, when I am home for long periods of time, I watch my little niece and nephew um, who are two and one, or I'm, I'm just open to the house sittings and the pet sittings and just having things in my life that keep me flexible and that sort of lend itself to living simply. Well, I'm really interested to talk about the different ways that you are funding this lifestyle. I know that you mentioned, you know, photography and your extremely creative artwork, which I can't wait to, you know, see some samples of and and check out your website and and even going so far as to babysitting some relatives. I think that's great because that's those are things that all lend to being free and still having the flexibility to do things on your own terms and whenever you want. So I'm kind of curious, especially with the photography aspect of it, because this is something that I personally would have just assumed is a completely saturated market. You know, there's so much, you know, I mean, there's so many images online yes. and it's like, you know, I never would have really assumed that people could still make money as a photographer these days without having like, you know, a store that they sell photography out of constantly. Yes. So do you mind just talking about that experience? And I mean, did you even have photography experience prior to going to Switzerland? None. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Pure and simple. Um, You know, I've said this before. Again, I really owe Switzerland a lot because you can barely go wrong when you are traveling in remote parts of Switzerland in the fall with photography. So I really had an amazing first experience, (laughs) like foray into that world and was able to capture some really great images. Okay. But there are a few things that are going to probably surprise you. One of them, yes, I had zero photography experience. I, I feel like I've always been a creative person and I've, I, you know, could take a good picture, mm-hmm. but I definitely felt, and frankly, even after Switzerland, or it wasn't really until after Switzerland, maybe even the next trip after that, that I actually started to sort of show my work. So I wasn't thinking about that going to Switzerland. It just was very, it happened very organically. So not only did I have, did not have an experience, but I have only, I mean, I'm kind of embarrassed to even admit this. So photographers like all close your ears right now, but I have only used Apple products since I've started this. So I've used iPads and iPhones. Wow. Obviously, over the years, those things have gotten better. But it was so interesting, Brittany, because I was just sharing this with somebody the other day. When I went to Antarctica this past fall, 
there, I would say 50% of the people on the ship had these lenses that were the Mm -hmm. size of a one-year-old. And they would carry them around the ship and like literally like they were babies and just the lenses. <laughs> and here I was with my little iPhone and I would see, you know, there's a lot of like sharing platforms that people can put up their pictures from the trip and whatnot. So you can see what other people are taking. And I have to admit my pictures based on my perspective, the time of day, what I chose to do. I mean, I actually don't like fiddle with my pictures very often. I really like to, you know, produce them in like natural with mm-hmm. as, as much of a natural state as possible. Um, the filters to me that are out like, uh, it just, I don't like using them. Right. So, you know, just to compare even, it's really not that much different. And I was even really surprised when I came back from that particular trip, how I actually love doing oversized canvases. And the quality of those pictures came out so amazingly beautiful. Wow. So anyway, you know, I will say that I know that there is, uh, you know, there's, you know, uh, everyone sort of thinks they can be a photographer these days. And listen, I'm, I was probably on that bandwagon like five years ago, (laughs) but I would not say that now because I do think the quality of picture just based on the perspective and what you do with the shot and what times of day, blah, blah, blah. I've learned a lot over the years to make sure that I'm capturing the best images. I edit like crap when I get home. I mean, like, you know, I'm not one of those people that puts up on my website, you know, a hundred of my best pictures. I will pick eight good pictures and put them up there, you know, that best represent maybe my trip. So I am very mindful that there's a lot of it out there. Having said that, even though my work is on my website and I do showcase it and it, it is purchasable from my website, where I get the income, um, where where I really see a benefit in that area is by connecting with customers. And the best way to do that is through art shows and through my vendor space. A perfect example is I happen to be replenishing my vendor space here in San Diego recently, one morning this past week. And there were a couple customers in the store. I happened to overhear that they were looking for cards. I do a line of cards. Uh, with like different travel destinations on them and whatnot. And it turns out that I ended up selling like several products just by speaking with them about their own travels and connecting with them. It it makes such a difference to be able to connect with people and share your stories behind the pictures. So that's really when it happens for me is when I'm at those art shows and the people are drawn to a picture for some reason. And I can really talk to them about what this picture is all about and where it was taken. And that's when the interest really happens. So anyway, those would be a few things I would say just about that, the photography. And, you know, it's, it's a lot different than just, you know, putting some, uh, you know, uploading my, my photos to my website. Right. So there is a lot of work that goes beyond that. And uh, you have to be willing to put in that time still. And so some tips for people who are just using like their iPhone or um, Mm -hmm. cell phone or anything like that, you know, they're not really getting into the expensive DSLRs and the thousand dollar lenses. Um, (laughs) Yeah, I know. So somebody who, who thinks they have a good eye, you know, maybe they're, they're in that range where they're like, "Mm, I don't know, could I be a photographer? Like, let's look into this a little bit more, but not pour all this money into it. You know, what's something that they could do now to kind of just help you know, make their photos a little bit better, you know, make sure that they're taking the best pictures they can, you know, with the equipment they have now. Yeah. Well, I think that still, obviously, a lot of the photographic principles and, you know, that they tell you with a regular camera are still applicable, obviously, as far as the light is concerned and, you know, the law of thirds and, you know, a lot of things that we all sort of know that are very basic photography you know, uh, sort of rules of thumb. But I really think you have to be discerning about your subject matter. To your point earlier about how there's a zillion pictures, you know, I'm not going to go to Paris and put a picture of the Eiffel Tower on my website. Right. You know, there's just too much of it. So um, you do have to have a discerning eye for what your shot is, what you're trying to convey. And 
really think about it from an outsider's perspective and why it would be different to them. And so I do really think about that. The other thing that I would say is if you can find someone who you respect as a photographer, or, you know, I've been very lucky with some of the art shows that I've done and have shown my work to other photographers, and I love getting their feedback. And if you can get feedback from someone who's been doing it for a long time or whose work you respect, I think it's worth every minute with those people because you really can learn a lot. I've actually, I still, I know this is probably terrible, maybe not. I mean, sometimes these things just happen organically, right? (laughs) But I still have intentions of taking some more advanced photography classes just to kind of just add a little bit more meat to my own you know, skill set. Mm-hmm. So I think it, there's a lot to be learned as with anything, but, but don't be afraid to ask people's opinions who might be in the field already and see what kind of feedback they might be able to give you. Okay. And so for somebody who's interested in checking out your work, where can they view that at? Yeah. So I have a website that houses my blog and my articles, as well as my photography and artwork. And that is at robingoes2.com. My brand and business name is Robin Goes To. So robingoes2.com is my website. And um, that's really where I house everything kind of all in one place. So it all kind of works together. And, you know, you might see a, a photograph of, a, you know, a penguin in Antarctica. And I always link them to what I've written about them through my blog post so that you can kind of get a backstory on it or um, read a little bit more about that particular location or destination. Perfect. Yeah, I love how that all works together like that. Yeah. Um, And I think that is critical about having that backstory because I know I've been to a few different, you know, art shows and things like that. And and an image is great. But when you know the effort that went into it, when you know the photographer hiked for 10 hours to get to that location, you know, I mean, it really adds a whole other layer to it. Oh, I totally agree. The one photo I was mentioning earlier is a picture that I took on that one of those first hikes, you know, remember when I jumped off Mm -hmm. the train (laughs) in the middle of nowhere, there's an area in Switzerland called the Aros Gorge. And it's on the French side of the country. And it's quite remote. But there is this was this amazing stone bridge that went over a creek. And it just again, middle of fall, it was such a gorgeous shot. That truly has been one of the images that I get the most positive feedback on time and time again. I mean, even after five years, for sure. So for people to know sort of the story of getting there um, or happening upon it, it, it does just add an element of interest, I think. So yeah, I agree with you. I, th- I think that if you can connect in that way with people about your photography, it makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Well, one final question here for part one, since we're running out of time, or sorry, for part two, since we're running out of time. (laughs) Sure. For anyone who is needing to make a change, you know, maybe they're content with their life, but they're just not, you know, overjoyed with it. It's okay, but it's not great. You know, they want something more and they think travel's the answer, but they obviously need to have a way to fund it. And they need, you know, the flexibility that will allow them to spend however much time traveling as they they want or they need. Mm -hmm. But the idea of, you know, making money in a location independent business is so daunting. I mean, there are so many ways to do it. For sure. So what do you recommend to somebody to kind of help them figure out, you know, what maybe is the right path for them? How can they make money online and still be able to travel? Yeah. You know, the first thing I would say, Brittany, that I really kind of went to an extreme with this this year in particular is I think it is so important to start embracing a simpler life. And that's a very big like order, right? (laughs) Very, it's a very tall order for a lot of people. I, if I may, I will just tell you, I mean, this may be an interesting article for some of your listeners to to listen to. I wrote an article that actually ran again in the Huffington Post as of late, and it's called What I've Learned from Living Out of a Suitcase. And the truth is, I actually live out of a suitcase even when I'm home. I decided that it was time for me to pare down just about everything. And I live very simply. There's so many things that 
this process has enabled me to do. I mean, not only does it keep things simple at home, but it does allow for more flexibility. So simplifying life, I think, is a big one. I decided, as I know, I just read in one of your, I don't know, I think it was one of your recent podcast guests that they had sold their home or they were planning to sell their home, whatnot. And I just did that myself uh, last fall. I decided it was time to sell my condo and be rid of that sort of miring me down. Mm -hmm. And I also sold everything in my condo. And so I am truly floating right now. (laughs) (laughs) So, But for me, it's something that works because it goes back to those goals of wanting to have the flexibility to travel for longer periods of time and at times when I want to travel and also being able to spend more time with my family and friends coming back to that. You know, again, selling your home is a pretty big, it's that in itself can be daunting. And I don't, I'm not telling anyone that that's what they (laughs) need to do in order to do this, but I'm just saying that it is possible to kind of live more simply in order to kind of mentally prepare yourself for a life that might be more filled with travel. And I think it also goes back to what I was saying earlier about needing to think creatively about how to earn income. And obviously, a lot of your podcast guests have figured out ways to do this. But, you know, I, having worked in corporate America and for a company that I enjoyed working for, that was very good to me over the years that I was quite fulfilled with for the majority of the years I was there uh, for 16 years, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. You know, I really, it would have been very easy for me to continue to work there probably until I retired. But I do think that when you kind of flip that switch about how to earn income based on your travel needs, let's say. I mean, that's just one example. You really do start to see that there are, to your point, a multitude of ways of doing that. And it's important to kind of think outside the box. It's also important to completely let, if you can, which is not always easy to do, let what other people think fall off of you. That was actually not to get off on too much of a tangent, but that was a bit of um, a surprise to me. I wasn't quite prepared for that. I think when I made this change in my life, that there are a lot of people who are not comfortable with me or somebody, you know, living an unconventional lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And the idea of change of going from something that was as stable as what I had to not knowing and not really knowing where I was going to land. I felt that I was unlocking this whole world of freedom for myself. What was an interesting part of that process is that I felt like in the process I needed to actually grow a thicker skin because there were a lot of people around me that were not really supportive of it. And so I think that if you can kind of let go of that outside influence and just really be true to how you want to live, it's a really important transition to make. Anyway, those might be some sort of hippy dippy ways of talking about it. But I do think that some of that is important in making a change like this. And that wraps up my interview with Robin Rodig from Robin Goes To. If you would like to learn more about Robin or check out her photography, just go to the show notes on my website and you can find those at livinguncommensionally.com forward slash 181. And of course, those are the actual numbers 181. I do want to remind you to check out the Living Unconventionally Facebook community. If you are not a member already, you are missing out because they are the first to know about updates to the podcast and my personal travels. All you have to do to join is go to livinguncommensionally.com forward slash Facebook. You'll then be automatically redirected to the group, and I will personally approve your request to join. And lastly, since this episode involves having a career that allows for time freedom and location independence, I do want to take this time to remind you that a client of mine and a good friend, April Beach, who is the amazing business coach behind the Sweet Life Entrepreneur brand, is about to open up her Sweet Life launch program on January 8th. 
This is a three-month mentorship program, and it's a clear, proven step-by-step system to design and launch your own business in 90 days. It includes private coaching with April, a profit plan, a launch checklist, weekly masterclasses, a Facebook ads expert, and the opportunity to attend an in-person retreat with April in Boulder, Colorado in April, and maybe possibly meet up with me since you'll be less than two hours away and I might actually secretly maybe be attending the event myself. If you want to work with April so that you can finally launch a freedom business of your own, go to livingunconventionally.com forward slash sweet life. That is S-W-E-E-T-L-I-F-E to learn more. And if you reserve your spot by the end of December, you'll receive a discounted price. Now, I do want to mention that I will receive a commission for anyone that signs up using my link, but I'm actually getting ready to personally hire April myself to help me create the launch strategy and sales funnel for my first online course because I really trust and value her expertise. So I would absolutely not be recommending this program to you if I didn't wholeheartedly think that April could get you where you need to go. So again, visit livingunconventionally.com forward slash sweet life to finally get started towards your goal of location independence and time freedom. Thank you so much for joining me today. I will see you back here on Friday for this week's solo episode where I'm going to talk about my solo trip to Chiang Mai, Thailand. Have a fantastic day. 